there, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel depending on how long we've known each other. You may recognize me from previous blockbusters like two sock puppets talking about how enthusiastic they are about waterproof shoes or one of my greatest award-winning performances, girl who puts shoes on her hands and makes them dance around like their little feet. But today, I just want to put theatrics aside and I want to come to you one person to another to tell you how much I love Vessi shoes. I know I've talked about Vessi shoes many times and the truth is I honestly love these shoes. I have three pairs of shoes, one pair of slippers, and it'll never be enough. I will always want more pairs of Vessi shoes. Vessi is a fantastic shoe brand. All of their products are sustainably made and vegan. And the best part about them is that they are waterproof and snowproof, 100%, which I can vouch for because I just survived an entire winter in Lille in the north of France, depending entirely on these shoes. I have never lived in a rainier climate in my entire life. And if it weren't for these shoes, I would not have been going to the gym on a regular basis because it's like a two and a half kilometer walk for me. I would not, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't have gone anywhere. To be honest, I probably, probably would have just stayed inside all winter. <laughs> these really are my leave them by the door, throw them on and go shoe. Whether it's like running to the supermarket, just running errands, going for a walk to get some fresh air. But they are also so easy and quick to slip on my feet that if I get a delivery or something, I just toss them on, run outside, grab my package, wish the delivery guy a good day and run back inside. One of the most magical things about these shoes when I got them was no breaking in period. Like when I put them on my feet, it was immediately comfortable. With any line of their shoes, I've never had any issues with my toes being scrunched or my heel being blistered or anything like that. It's really like putting a pair of socks on, except um, I guess it's a little more comfortable than, you know, wearing a pair of socks around town. <laughs> If you are looking for a pair of waterproof, snowproof, super comfy sneakers that are lightweight and pretty much pair with like any outfit that you've got, I highly suggest checking out their website. They come in limited edition colors, so you know, you might, if you look right now, you might be able to snatch a color that you really love before they rotate through the next seasonal collection. So go ahead and check it out. If you follow the link in the description down below or you use the code Betsy Begonia, you'll get $25 off any pair of Vessi shoes. I can't recommend this shoe brand enough. I think I have recommended it many times. And uh, honestly, speaking from my heart, I love these freaking shoes. Now, I'm really sorry to tell you this. Um, we're gonna have to move on to the main event. And um, it's about one of our worst enemies in the plant world, mites. Trigger warning, arachnophobes, trigger warning, there will be footage. <laughs> Today I wanna to talk about three types of mites that frequently infest plants. One of them, specifically Hoyas, from what I understand and what I have experienced and what I have seen. So firstly, I'm going to talk about the three types of mites that you will most commonly see on your plants. I wanna talk about how to identify them and how to differentiate between those mites. And then thirdly, I'm gonna tell you how to treat those mites in a few different ways. The best known mite and the most visible mite that people tend to get on their plants is Tetranicus urticea. And that is the, it's called the red spider mite or sometimes the two spotted spider mite. It can appear very red. And this one is definitely visible to the eye. This is the type of mite that will spin webs on your plants. And usually when you start to see webbing on your plants, it means that the, infest the infestation has gone quite far and you might have a, a situation on your hands where you might just have to throw that plant away because treating it might be too difficult. It depends. We'll talk about treatment options a little bit later. This mite attacks a wide distribution of plants, not just Hoyas. <laughs> You know, I will get to the I'll get to the one that really loves Hoyas. The thing is, this one is often mixed up with the false spider mite, which is also red. However, I will say that this one, Tetranicus urticea, you're, 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 how do you say it? Tetranicus urticea. Okay, Tetranicus urticea. Yeah, I got it right. I got. 
I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Uh, it can get mixed up with something called the false spider mite. They are two different species of mite. They do look different, although they both appear bright red. However, like I said, the first kind, Tetranicus urdacea, is visible to the naked eye. Like you see those webs, you see those things infesting your plants. The false spider mite, much more difficult to spot. So when I have seen examples of the uh, yeah, Tetranicus urdacea, the red spider mite slash two spotted spider mite, the one that makes webs and things like that, they, they tend to infest the entirety of the leaf. You'll see their webs all over the leaves. It seems like they kind of just take over the entire plant. And so that's how I always thought spider mites work. Like if you have mites, you'll be able to see them. They're visible. They'll be on the leaves, usually on the undersides of the leaves until they start, you know, creating webbing. You'll see them crawling between the, you know, the webs and things like that. Um, however, false spider mites do not behave the same way. Tenui palpidea is the false spider mite. It's bright red. It's also known as a flat mite. And here's the thing about this mite. It is nearly invisible to the naked eye. You might be able to spot them with a magnifying glass, like you might be able to see the orange dots. They're quite slow moving. Most, like all three of these mites are quite slow moving. And so they don't really capture your attention through movement. I know some people who have not spotted them until they were taking really close up photographs of their plants with a macro lens. And that's when they discovered that they had these false spider mites. And that's basically what happened to me because I had always had the understanding that if you have mites, you can see them. They make webbing, etc., and they're on the leaves. I would check my plant leaves and I would never see any mites or anything. So I just thought, well, I don't have mites. I don't have a mite problem. <laughs> no, wrong. So what I did is I purchased a really cheap USB microscope. I actually bought this because I thought it would come in handy for hand pollination of Hoyas because I have become really interested in hand pollinated Hoyas. It's very difficult to achieve. I'm still learning. I have not successfully hand pollinated a Hoya yet. But then I started turning this microscope onto, for example, um, a small plant, Hoya evelinea, and it just never seemed to grow. One month went by, two months went by, this plant just would not grow. And so I started looking at it under the microscope. I was actually I was actually looking at everything under the microscope because I don't know if you're anything like me, but like once I, I got this microscope, everything. And what did I see? False spider mites that I had not seen in the two months that I had this plant. I just never knew that they were there because they were completely invisible to the naked eye. And also because they weren't on the leaves of the plant they were on the stems and the nodes. I noticed that false spider mites like to hang out all along the stem and at the nodes of the plant, but I've never seen one on a single leaf. And then of course, I spent like two, two days looking at every single plant that I own under the microscope and identifying that, you know, a handful of the plants, maybe five or six out of, I don't know how many plants, I have like over 300 plants, I don't know. <laughs> five or six of these plants had the flat spider mites. So I think you would be very surprised if you have a plant that's not growing particularly well. It's time to maybe get a microscope, get a magnifying glass. This is a pretty good indicator that it has some form of mite. And the last mite that I wanna talk about is literally microscopic. And that's why most people have no idea that they have it. I had this type of mite on one, uh, my Hoya Dacia that I got in early 2019 and it just wouldn't grow and it wouldn't grow and it wouldn't grow and it wouldn't grow and it wouldn't grow. I thought, man, what more can I do for, sorry, <laughs> what more can I do for this plant to make it grow? I don't understand. Like sometimes it starts to put out a leaf, then the leaf turns yellow and the leaf falls off. My friend Emily, who's known as Hoya Maniac on Instagram, she's Sweden. So she's Sweden. <laughs> she represents all that is Sweden. She's Swedish. They have a word for this mite that infects Hoyas specifically. Let me see what she calls it. Topscotts. Okay. Well, that's a toughie. That's a toughie right there. Topscotts. 
Falsa. Something like that. That translates directly to top shoot or top growth mite. And I believe that this mite belongs to the family called Tarsinomidea. They're also known as dwarf mites, broad mites, uh, white mites, and thread-footed mites. So this is like a really vast family of mite. So I, I can't identify the exact species of mite that is appearing on these Hoya plants, but I can tell you the behavior of this mite, what to look for, and how to treat it. And of course, I'll, I'll tell you how to treat all of these mites in one fell swoop. Uh, where is Dacia? Yeah. I'm gonna pull my plants up here. So it all started with the Dacia that I got in 2019. It always seemed to have its mature leaves. It just could never put out healthy new growth. And I was very impatient, but I guess I was very patient with it because I didn't throw it away. It's like 2022 and I still have this freaking plant. But if I had not kept this plant, I never would have learned about this type of mite from Emily. Pretty quickly, I caught on to how to identify if a Hoya has it. And then after that, I bought Peninsularis. And as soon as I brought it home and got a good look at it, I thought, mm, it's got, it's definitely got white mites. And you'll notice that it is white on the leaves. It looks terrible and that's because I had treated it with sulfur at some point and sulfur does stay on the leaves for some time. It makes them look kind of scummy. The last plant that I got, it was from the same vendor. It is, um, it's a verticillata, heart-shaped leaves. And it was just, in, just, again, immediately obvious to me once I understood the signs that this plant had white mites. And so it was around the same time that I got a microscope and I started taking a really close look at these plants. You cannot, you absolutely cannot see these broad mites unless you have a microscope. They are literally microscopic and they are the same color as the stem of the Hoya. So even with the microscope, it can be hard to spot them. You have to be very patient. You have to aim it. You have to figure out exactly where you're gonna be able to spot them. You're gonna be able to spot them around nodes that may be trying to put out new growth, hence their name, top growth mites. I assure you, if you have little nubby growths like this on your Hoya and it has not put out growth in a long time, I guarantee that you will find these mites. I don't know if th this type of mite attacks any other type of plant. So that's why I'm using Hoya as an, as an example. And so I will show you some close-up B-roll of the evidence that these mites leave behind. And you'll notice on the Dacia, for example, all this nubby growth, all these little, you know, areas where it seemed like it was gonna put out a new leaf. You can find a pretty cheap digital microscope on Amazon that will do the job. I can put my Amazon affiliate link to this one down in the description below. You don't have to get this one, there are other ones, but basically this is just a USB microscope that plugs into my computer. This is just a nice, it's a handy tool to have around if you have a lot of plants and uh, you wanna diagnose them very quickly. Okay, so this is probably what you came for. How do you get rid of the mites? I have three suggestions that I can make. And it's kind of a situation where you have to choose one of the three or do them in a very specific order. So the first thing that you can do is, uh, you know, take the plant outside, put it in the shower, hose it down really well, just to get rid of any adult mite population that you may have on the plant right now. You have to know that that is not going to get rid of your spider mite infestation. There are eggs on the plant that don't readily rinse off. And within three days, you're going to have a new spider mite infestation all over again. So you cannot just rinse the plant off and call it a day. The first thing you can do is use a pesticidal spray. And from what I understand, sulfur or a pesticidal spray with sulfur in it works best against mites. I have heard, uh, and I, do, I don't have any facts to back this up right now, but I have heard that using something like pyrethrin can actually cause the mites to build up a tolerance and then they can get worse. But as far as I'm aware, sulfur is very, very handy against mites and it will wipe them out. It won't kill their eggs, but it will kill the adult mites and the larva. So if you are going to go the pesticide route, you're going to have to treat the plants once a week for six to eight weeks. The mites have a life cycle and you have to keep up with that life cycle and you have to do it religiously. If you spray them one week, spray them a second week, 
and then let the plant go for four weeks because you were too busy or you were too lazy to keep up with the treatments, you're going to have a full blown mite infestation on your hands all over again. So you really have to treat it once a week for four to eight weeks to ensure that every single time those eggs hatch, you're killing the adults and you're killing the larva. It's very tedious and it is not my preferred method of treating mites. I'm busy and I don't have time for that, especially when I have so many plants. If you have 10 or 12 plants that you have discovered have mites, oh my God, it's gonna take forever to treat all those plants once a week for four to eight weeks, like that's just forever. I just don't like doing sulfur. First of all, sulfur leaves this really ugly white residue on my plants. And it's very hard to get that sulfur off of those leaves. Plus, I know it's not good for me to be using sulfur or pyrethrin or anything like that. And it's definitely not good for my cats. Pyrethrin is highly toxic to cats. It's really hard for me to keep my cats out of whatever I'm doing, especially Worm. She's very curious and she wants to be involved all the time. That's why I call her Chief Me Too. And I know that some people believe in neem oil. I personally have not had a fantastic time with neem oil. The smell of it is so heinous, it will give me like a two hour headache. So I'm just not really a fan of neem. You can use neem if you want, if it works for you, like if you have a microscope and you can keep up on treatments and you can prove that it does get rid of your mite population, please do share that with me. I would love to know if neem oil works. I would like to emphasize if you are treating your plants with sulfur and neem, always leave a 30 day window between a sulfur treatment and a neem oil treatment because the two of those mixed together is toxic to plants and it will kill them. The second thing that you can use and one of the things that worked for me, just worked, period, is predatory mites, but you do have to get the, the correct type of predatory mite. I got a mite called Amblyseus californicus. I'll put it on the screen because it's, you know, it's a lot to say, it's a mouthful. I got 100 little sacks, like they can come in sacks. Each sack was supposed to have 100 mites. So 100 sacks with 100 mites each. It was really overkill because from what I've read, you only need like one mite per cubic meter or one mite per two cubic meter of plant or something. But it was my only option. Like it was the only company in France that sold this type of mite, wiped everything out. Just completely, they're so fast. I think I might have some footage under the microscope of the predatory mites. They're so fast. They're much, much faster than the false spider mites. Within a week, I looked at my plants under the microscope and the only thing I saw were predatory mites. So that worked for me. The one thing that I noticed is that they did not go after the white mites because I, I had a tray of these um, heart-shaped verticillata cuttings. I laid like eight of those sacks across the tray. And for whatever reason, they did not take out the population of the white mites. It seems to me that Amblyseus californicus does not feed on this type of mite, but they do feed on other types of mites. Unfortunately, I don't know what kind of predatory mite goes after these mites because I don't know what I don't know what type of mite this is. The last thing that worked for me, truly worked for me, and the one that I really prefer, it's the quickest, it's the most efficient, it gets the job done pretty immediately, and it doesn't require any pesticides, and it doesn't require any money. Put your plants in warm water. I have read that if you submerge a plant in water that is maintained at a temperature between 110 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which I think is 43 degrees Celsius to 49 degrees Celsius, for at least 10 minutes, you will eradicate numerous pests, aphids, mealybugs, scale, mites, and their eggs. So I decided to try this on a few of my plants. I have like a big pot. I have like a, a six or an eight liter pot in my kitchen. <laughs> so I got an underwater thermometer, got the temperature up to 46 degrees Celsius, which is like 115 degrees Fahrenheit. I was just kind of like meeting in the middle. 
and then I left the plants submerged in that water for 15 minutes. I checked them every five days for three weeks. I think now it's been one entire month. No mites. It was very easy, it was very simple because I have a pot, like an eight liter pot on my stove. It was easy for me to maintain the temperature on my stove and I have these small plants or at least it was smaller than it is now. Also, my plants are in pond. So there was no need for me to uproot the plant. I really just took this pot, dropped it in the water, in the pond and everything. If you're doing this and you have organic mix, then it's very likely that you're going to have to unpot the plant, get rid of the old potting mix, then submerge the plant in the warm water and then repot it with entirely new potting mix. So there is an extra step, an extra step involved. Now, when it comes to bigger plants, maybe get a sous vide cooker. One of those cookers that, you know, like you put it on the, you know what a sous vide, I'll put a picture on that. I don't know how to describe a sous vide cooker. <laughs> Underwater cooker. <laughs> maybe get a big plastic bin, put the sous vide cooker on the side, make sure that the water is at, you know, between 110, 120, Fahrenheit and put your plants in there if it's big enough to contain them. This is like such a great method. It doesn't cost a lot of money as long as you have a big pot and a little bit of time on your hands. And that's it. That's all I have to say. I just wanted to talk about those three types of mites, which are the most common mites that you will find on house plants. If you do have any information about this species or you know what whatever mite this is please leave it in the comments down below i would love to be able to identify this mite so that i can understand more about its lifespan and how to get rid of it and i hope that i've provided you with a few ideas on eradicating mites that you may have and that you know maybe you'll get a new tool and you uh will discover you might discover that you have mites yeah i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> if you get this, you might discover that you have mites. Anyway, I really hope that you enjoyed this video and that it was informative and helpful. If you have any questions, leave it in the comments down below. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time. I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, my Hoya Magosh patrons, Carolyn Green, Christina Greengrass, and Frederick Bowman, my Begonia buddies, Adam Banzoff, Anonymous Aardvark, Anne Magritte Moen, Casey Smyrnatopoulos, Charlie, Krabby Cat, Darcy Levage, Aaron Mio, Fenner Lamb, Hannah Trankel, Jordan, Kayla Mann, Kristen Moore, Leah A, Michelle A, Michelle Sadlowski, Robin L. Jennings, Samantha, Sherry Kumar, Tish McCann, Ula Umlaut, and Wendy Foreman, and my Pothos pals, Abby Estes, Amanda, Ashley Eagle, Brianna Phillips, CC, Christina Wong, Claire Lynn, Elizabeth Mary, Elizabeth Velasquez, Emma Greenwood, James Cox, Cassandra Lewis, Karen Nielsen, Kayla Valra, Kelly Ash, Kelly Westover, Lexi Haynes, Lydia, Lisa Glandon, Natalie Kenda, Nicholas Curtis, Olga, Plant Girl 50, Brie, Plantalenia, Sabrina C, Shelly Ebert, Steve A, Tina Halberg, Vertigris Dreams, Wanyang Zhang, and Zen Simmer. Thank you all so much for the support you've shown me.